interested now in, in learning uh, seven steps to doubling your income and revenue over the next 12 months? Say yes. 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 Okay, we'll continue then. Um, so can you imagine if we just stopped? I, I, I'll pause here to just share you. I was giving a speech in Destin a, a few months ago. And literally, I had planned to give this talk, but several people, there were questions and ran out of time and just several other reasons. And so the speech, literally, I stopped right there with, uh, with sharing some of these thoughts. <laughs> so they never got this. So hopefully, uh, you know, maybe you can share it with somebody down the road. Seven secrets. Number one, it takes a powerful brand, a powerful brand. Establish credibility. If you don't have credibility today as a person or as a company, you need to align yourself with someone who does. We talked about it in a different way. We said it a different way last night when we said, uh, who, who has your prospects? Who currently has your, your prospects? Align yourself with them and you, their, pros, their clients become your prospects, or their, their clients become your clients. That's how we positioned it last night. Today, I want to position it as that you are establishing credibility by aligning yourself with other companies. If I'm able to put my company brand next to ABC company brand, my brand immediately becomes elevated. I can speak today like this, but let's take the movie that several of us were in. You know, Brian Tracy, has anybody heard of him? He's a great sales, marketing, business consultant, things of that nature. He's done so many books and CDs and cassettes since before I was born, literally. And uh, so, phenomenal guy. Well, when we had the opportunity to be in a movie with him, what does that then do to, to our brand? It raises it, it elevates it. All of a sudden people say, oh, you're with Brian Tracy. Oh, we, we start to associate you with these other people, these other high caliber people. And it's not just a photo op, it's genuine, it's real. There's alignment, there's name recognition. When they say this name, they put it with this name. If you have a company, you could take a brand, and if, if uh, local companies, Gulf Power sponsors a lot of things, Studio Group sponsors a lot of things, there's several companies around locally that have a quality brand. If you want to immediately be known as a quality organization, it's a very simple thing to start sponsoring things that they are a part of. And so that there's only, usually there's only two, three, or four sponsors, and your logo is right next to the other one. And all of a sudden, perception, the powerful brand that I'm talking about that's required to double income in 12 months in personal, revenue, or personal income and in corporate revenue is to establish that credibility. And you can borrow credibility before you have your own. That's the key. Borrow it. It's fine to borrow it. All right, powerful brand. Second, second secret is having a powerful team. Having a powerful team. You know, the highest paid athletes are not individuals, are they? On average. There's obviously a handful of exceptions. Those could almost be counted on one hand. The highest paid athletes are in team sports, on average. The average tennis player does not make what the average NFL player does, or what the average NBA player does. The, and the same thing goes with golf and a number of other sports. Team sports pay more than individual sports. You must have a powerful team. You will not accomplish, if, you have, if your goals and dreams are of any size at all, you will not accomplish it by yourself. And that's the biggest mistake that many entrepreneurs make is they try and do it all themselves. They start to work in the business not on the business. They get caught up doing, 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 doing that they don't step back and say, who am I? Who am I attracting? Who's, you know, who's my audience and where are they? What problem do I solve and who owns that problem? They're asking the wrong questions. If you want right answers, you have to ask right questions. That's why there, there's even a book called Questions Are the Answers. And a QBQ is another good one. So you have to understand a powerful team, all right? And you know, real quickly, one of the best illustrations of teamwork that I, I love is, have, have any, I guess, how many people have seen the movie Nemo, the kids movie, all right? A few people have seen Nemo, yeah. You know what, great little movie, great storyline, but my, one of my favorite parts in the whole thing is after Nemo finds his dad, or I guess his dad finds him, and they're all happy and jumping around, and all of a sudden the net catches up, you know, a bunch of fish, and Dory, remember Dory, the fish that helped Marlon find Nemo, all right, that kind of loopy, all right, she kind of gets knocked out a little bit and is laying 
on top of the fish pile as this net's being brought up. And Nemo sees this, and he's like, Dad, Dad! And they, they recognize what's happening. So they start to try and go in, and they start to try and get her, and they can't do it. It's too much. It's impossible for the two of them to do it on their own. And so what Nemo does is he takes charge of the situation, and he starts swimming all around them, and, he, and they start saying, uh, to tell, instructing everybody to push, to swim down, swim down, swim down. And they even start chanting, you know, uh, to get everybody, to, all the fishes to start swimming down to break the net or to, or to stop it. And so they start working together and working, and that's what happened. They were able to accomplish, with through other people's efforts, what they were not able to accomplish on their own. And that's the issue that many companies don't recognize. But I can assure you this. I have spoken to, what, to, to the current Inc. 500 list. I have spoken uh, either via email or phone call to 100 of the top 500 Fortune, uh, I'm sorry, Inc. 500 fastest growing companies in America, to the CEOs and the leaders of these companies. And I'm telling you without, without exception, every single one of them mentioned that one of the keys to their success was that they focused on their core competencies, what they were good at, and they outsourced everything else. They looked for all the things that they could not do, not the things that, uh, that they could do. Well, we need to start taking orders. We need a, so instead of having a call center, they outsource to the customers, or they outsource the call center to take the orders. Instead of trying to become their own, build their own website, they outsource that to somebody, to a professional who knows how to build websites. Instead of trying to do everything themselves, they found the experts and delegated to them. You don't have to hire everything in your life, personally or, or professionally. So that was one of the, that's the other thing. Powerful brand, powerful team. Number three, a powerful purpose. Your purpose has to, should be more than money. Or you're, or you're not going to be very satisfied, are you? Because money comes and money goes. And hopefully more comes than goes. But that's your choice. And I originally shared that last night. But at the end of the day, money is not the be-all, end-all. But in terms of business, I do make it my goal to put money in your pockets. The goal of this weekend for me is to put money in your pockets. How do I do that? I mean, I'm not pulling out you know, my wallet and, and handing out hundreds here. How do I put money in your pocket? Through knowledge. Through information. Through education. That is how we are putting money in your pockets this weekend. And perhaps you didn't even know it. All right? Powerful purpose. To me, that's a whole lot more powerful than making a buck. It's the lives that are changed. It's the companies that are changed. If you've got a company doing 10000 a year in revenue right now, and you're doing $20,000 at the end of this year, this was a success. And at the end, over the next 12 months, then this was a success. Because it's about your goals, your dreams, your purposes, and you have to have a powerful brand, a powerful team, a powerful purpose, and you have to have powerful persistence. Les Brown said, when you stop fighting for what you want, what you don't want automatically takes over. You know, there, there's only two ways to learn. And I share this in one of my books, Mistakes and Mentors. And I don't know why, but unfortunately, I've chosen repeatedly in my life to learn by mistakes. <laughs> The mentor's guide, obviously, is much, but I've, you learn to use mentors a whole lot better. But especially early on, I thought, I don't even know anybody that's done what I've done. Why in the world would I ask for their advice? I don't want where they are or who they are or end up where they're at. Why would I, so I don't want to do what they did, what they do. You know, if you, it's the whole, if you want something you've never had, you have to do something you've never done. So how, how would they know what to do? But that's where you have to start finding who your mentors are. And by the way, if you don't know them personally, you have to meet them through books and through other things. And Ridgely's book, The Great Ones, talks about his mentorship story and uh, you know the power of mentorship. But you two ways to learn and to make mistakes. The bottom line is this. You're, you're going to have problems. You're going to have obstacles. It's not going to be easy. And it's going to be harder than what you think it is. It's going to take longer than you think it's going to take. And it's going to cost more than you think it's going to cost. That's just the bottom line. Everything does. But you've got to persist. You have to persist. 
my dad and I, my dad's not a big horse person. Um, I've loved horses most of my life. In fact, you saw one of, uh, one of uh, my hobby horses. <laughs> uh, remember when we were talking about the difference between a, a hobby and investment? Investment, you're making money. A hobby is when it starts to lose money. So I call it my hobby, my hobby horses because the horse market's been down. But anyway, it's a very, you know, costly equine. <laughs> and uh, by, by the way, at least you can insure that. I can't insure a lot of things, but at least you can insure those, those uh, birds. But so what happened is I got my dad to go riding with me. I had worked on a ranch, 110 acre ranch, or four of us cowboys that tended, I'm sorry, it's a 1500 acre ranch that four of us cowboys tended to 110 horses, did that for a couple of years. And when we were there, uh, so I, that's where I really got to ride all the time. I was in a saddle eight hours a day. I absolutely just loved horses. So I got back home after that, and we knew somebody that had a couple of horses. And one of those horses was absolutely ornery. It was the most, it was, it was a dumb horse. I mean, it's one of those that you could, you could smack it, and he's just going to do something else dumb. And it just, he was just odd. Very ornery, cranky. Sometimes he'd go, sometimes he wouldn't. It's like he never learned what, he just wasn't well trained, and he was, and he, and he didn't have sure footing, so sometimes he'd stumble on it. And you're just like, you know what? If you're at least going to be dumb, at least walk right. You know, walk straight. Do something right. This horse just didn't have anything going for him. But he was back, and he was massive. He was big. And then they had another horse. And by the way, that horse's name was Major. The other horse was named Lily. And Lily was a trail horse. Do you know what a trail horse is? Those are the horses that when you go pay a lot of money to ride horses, and they just put them in a single file line, and, you know, the horse that... Walmart goes faster than that trail horse, right? And the horse never brings its head, you know, above the rear end of the horse in front of it. I mean, it's just, the horse just looks pitiful. Have you ever seen those horses? The ones that just look really sad, all right? So that's what Lily was. So Lily and Major, you got somebody, you know, I don't care how hard you kick her, you couldn't get her moved, and you got this guy over here that, you know, who knows what's gonna happen. He's the wild card. So what happened is I got my dad, I finally convinced him, I said, Dad, you know, father-son outing and all this stuff. There was a lake. Well, we heard that there was a lake on the other side of a mountain. We said, let's just go in the woods. We'll explore. It'll be fun. We'll pack our lunch. We'll eat by the lake. If there is a lake, if not, we'll just eat. And we'll come back. So we'll ride all day. And he, he agreed to do that. And it, we had a fabulous ride. Um, we found, it wasn't a lake. It was a pond about the size of this room. But you know what? Uh, <laughs> but we still were able to tie up the horses, had a nice lunch. On our way back, we were getting to an open field, and I told him, I said, just stay right here. I said, I'm going to run I'm gonna run Major across the field, just because I wanted to show off for my dad. I wanted him to be like, man, that's my son, because we always watch the Westerns and see him run across, and, you know, the music, dun, 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 you know. So I was like, he's going to love this, and I've got the hat on, the whole, the whole nine yards. So I said, just stay right here by the woods. I'm going to run him across, all right? I just wanted my dad to be proud of him. So... I'm on him, and I start going, yeah, you know, and start taking off across. We're, we're, we are barreling across the field. And, you know, of course, I'm thinking he's going to fall any moment. I'm going to break a leg. He's going to fall in. He's a massive beast. And uh, so we, we're ripping across, and I didn't lose my hat, and, we, and he didn't stumble. I get to the end of the field, and I turn around to see the proud look on my dad's face. But instead, I saw Lily running to, right towards a marsh. Oh. In a dead, all-out run. Lily is a trail horse. All she knows to do is follow. And my dad, not being a horseman, the saddle had come loose. He was on the side of the horse. And by the time I saw what was happening, he, I actually saw him fall down into the marsh, about a foot of water, and was being dragged with one foot in the stirrup like that. I wheeled Major around, ran after my dad, and was just, you know, as fast as that horse could go, just, you know, just cracking the whip and getting over there to him. I pulled up alongside of him, pulled up alongside of my dad like this, and uh, grabbed Lily's reins in, 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 her, in the bridle, grabbed that, and was bringing her to a stop, but I had to do that without hurting my dad uh, because I was concerned that the hooves would stomp his face. Stopped Lily, and, you know, my dad soaked, he, no broken bones. I had I'd broken a couple of fingers because of how I had to lean off my horse while it's still in a dead run, stopping this horse in a dead run. I mean, it was better than anything you've seen on the movies. I assure you, I just wish I had video on it. <laughs> it was phenomenal. A little more than I bargained for that day. But you know what happened? He was obviously sh shooken up, shaken up. And we walked the horses. Obviously, I got off to help him up. We walked the horses back to the edge of the clearing. And my dad said at that time, uh, we, we, had to, we had to wait because the horses were both panicked. My dad was panicked. And I was like, 
oh, is this about this went south fast. Yeah, I mean, this is bad. But fortunately, no one was seriously injured. And I remember the barn was not too far away. And I remember my dad saying, I, I said, well, let's go ahead and head back. We'll just, and, and we started to walk the horses. And he goes, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm fine. I'll ride. I'm like, why would you ride? You hate horses and you just got your butt kicked, you know, by this one. Why would you do that? And you know, my dad didn't have to say, son, when life knocks you down, you get back up on the horse and keep going. He didn't give me some prolific lesson that day. But what he did was he showed me. His behavior illustrated to me that when problems come, it's not getting knocked down. It's getting back up again and again and again and again and again. And I don't care what happens today. I don't care what happens tomorrow in your life and in your business. It is your responsibility to get back up again, to get on the horse again. You have to have a powerful persistence. You have to have powerful tools. Leverage is one of the most powerful tools that you can have. We talked about it last night. You have to have a powerful attraction, a powerful attraction. We talked about that. And you have to have a powerful vision. Five years ago, I weighed 245 pounds, so I add about 80 pounds to me now. From flying around with in corporate America on their dime and their food, uh, and going to restaurants and whining and dining people, I would have to have two dinners, sometimes I'd have two lunches because different meetings, but they all had lunch. And whenever we had lunch, we'd order appetizers, we'd order the main course, we'd order dessert. And the way that they do it is you don't really eat it, you just have to order it so that they know you're not cheap. And nobody really eats it. Uh, they pick up the appetizers, they pick up you know, maybe the dessert, and they eat a little bit of their entree. And after doing that for several years, I was just like, you know, <laughs> it was bad. And I finally secured a meeting with the senior vice president of a, one of the lar largest companies in the financial services arena. Their marketing budget was bigger than our company's gross revenue, which was over $2 billion. <laughs> That's his spending budget. What we made was his budget, all right? They had blimps. They had s several cars in NASCAR that they sponsored. That's why we got to go to the suites and things of that nature. They, they had fields, uh, baseball fields and stadiums, and they just had all kinds of, they had the best Super Bowl commercials. Um, they just had all kinds of things. And I finally, one day, the CEO of our company could not, he would not meet with him, but he agreed to meet with me because I had about a thousand employees that were doing work for him and we were executing, but I had a problem with their team and told him I need to meet with him in order to accomplish both of our objectives. He agreed to meet, we agreed to meet in a, in a uh, off-site location so that it wasn't, there was a neutral geographic region. It wasn't my home, uh, my territory, and it wasn't his territory. We both flew in, we met for lunch, we met for the next three hours, and, but while we were at lunch, I started, I said, well, what do you want? We started to order, and he goes, you know what? I just want a salad, no, no appetizer, no dessert. I was like, whoa, I've never had anybody say this in years. And the guy's fit, trim, and, you know, I knew he had jumped on a private jet that day to get to where we were. I was still flying, uh, fortunately I was able to fly first class with that organization, but still, first class, private, no comparison, right? <laughs> And uh, so all of a sudden, any, anything I thought I was went out the window, right? So I'm sitting there, and I'm seeing this guy who got up at the crack of dawn. He was explaining how he ran that morning, and then he you know, caught the jet, went to where we were. And, but he still made it a priority to exercise and eat right. And I thought, if this guy who makes seven figures a year doing this stuff, flying around, he has just as busy a travel schedule as I've got, can do this, so can I. And I didn't wait till Monday to make this grand resolution of what I was going to do and how I was going to change my behavior and habits. I didn't wait till the new year. I didn't wait till a new month. I started then. I started that meal. It was over. It was done. And then I had to. And then I had to start exercising. The point is, you have to have a powerful vision of who you can be, of who you're going to be. The problem, the reason why a lot of people don't know where they're going, is because they don't know who they want to be. They don't know, understand where they're going. You know, if you just get in your car and drive. Who knows where you're going to end up? If you actually put it in a destination, at least you have a semblance of which direction to start. And then as you go, you can start asking people along the way, and you start making corrections. 
Success from an A, point A to point B is not a straight line. You're kind of going like this, and then somebody kind of corrects you a little bit, and you kind of go like this, and somebody corrects you a little bit, and then you kind of do this. See, that's the learning process, and that's fine. So a powerful vision. You know, let me share a couple things with you in closing here. A couple of opportunities. First of all, people always wonder what we do. How, well, I've shared how we do a lot of it, but they wonder how we do or what we do. And so companies hire iDream to come in in, in really a number of areas, cro, uh, create high growth revenue companies. Uh, B, uh, VC firms might hire, bring us in to evaluate what an opportunity is before they invest in the company. Uh, people, there's a couple of companies that are growing very fast, but they don't have the scalable operational infrastructure to be able to support that. They still have kind of Mickey Mouse procedures. You know, a phone call comes in or a conference call. The best one was a conference call uh, that an entire sales team, 10 people, had to send out an email every time they scheduled a demo uh, to all the other people. Oh, so I've got the conference bridge Thursday at 9. And then you get another email. I've got one Thursday at 1. And there wasn't a central place. There wasn't a calendar. There was nothing. And, you know, it's really cheap to get everybody their own conference bridge. So there's a lot of scalable operational efficiencies that can happen and that people can do.